facing the answer, or it was a milder version of that, going toward the answer. Okay, now we know what we're talking about. Well, this is the third uh, opportunity that I've had to talk to the community at these Wednesday night lectures. This is the last night of my residence, my scholar in residency at Esalen. So no more will you see the white on a field of vert, which is the escutcheon of the scholar in residence with his towel over his shoulder. <laughs> Somebody else will have to work a different angle. Somebody else will sit in this chair next month. Uh, it was a very interesting, rich time for me, and all kinds of things happened. It was uh, a microcosm of the macrocosm. It changed. There was despair and joy and over-visiting and indigestion and exaltation and dyspepsia and all these things. and. Uh, I'm very grateful to the regulars who attended my daily lecture. This was about 45 hours of lecture this month, so I'm running on empty uh, in a certain sense. I really feel like I've uh, run through the major motifs of my point of view, if my point of view is in any sense different from anybody else's. I uh, passed out information on botanical dimensions. I want to mention that again as the practical, real-world anchor of all these ideas. It is a uh, nonprofit foundation in Hawaii which preserves plants with a history of shamanic usage, especially plants from the warm tropics. And uh, this is something which is not being done by anyone else. The World Wildlife Fund, these large conservation organizations are saving the rainforest by preserving huge tracts of it. But what is not being preserved is human understanding of the rainforest, specifically human understanding of medicinal plants. And considering that quinine, the cure for malaria, uh, uh, <coughs> reserpine, the first of the tranquilizers, and many other major drugs with a significant impact on human health have come from the warm tropics, including possibly now a cure for AIDS in the form of the trichosanthus extract that's being experimented with. It's very important to preserve the medically important biota of the warm tropics. And this is something which means uh, taking seriously the shamanism and the traditions that live in those areas. So this is something that my wife Kat and I have been doing for over uh, about 12 years, and about five years ago incorporated as a nonprofit foundation. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of hands-on plant rescue, information rescue work, why please uh, write to us at the address on the, on the handout. This is, uh, well, I figure we have about 25 years uh, before this information will be completely assimilated into the encroaching consumer society, the leveling of values that seems now to be an inevitable part of the globalizing of society. On one level, it's very good. We, we recognize ourselves in our enemies, and uh, there's a commonality of values generated. But on another level, it's tremendously destructive of uh, novelty and uniqueness. I mean, we're turning the whole planet into a white bread mall shopping culture, and uh, the values of every other way of doing things is being subsumed to that. 
I talked a lot uh, in these Wednesday night lectures and with the section about uh, the importance of partnership societies in the human past and how the nostalgia for these kinds of social arrangements have driven us throughout our experience of history. Well, it is uh, nevertheless true that even today in the Amazon uh, and perhaps in a few other relict environments, uh, partnership societies exist. Partnership societies thrive and regulate themselves through a, relation, a symbiotic relationship to plants that we call hallucinogenic plant shamanism, but which is actually an almost a welding of the social organism into the natural surround in a way that feeds back into the psyches of these people and the structures of their society in a way that is very, uh, very much promotes the conservation of equilibrium something we have sadly lost touch with. So it's very important to preserve uh, the uh, options that have been discovered by people over the millennia, the options that allow a recreation of the uh, sensory and psychic ratios that characterize the partnership society in contrast to the kind of dominator society that we've lived under for such a long time. So it isn't a matter simply of preserving plants for medicines. It's really much more philosophically deep than that. It's the idea that uh, a relationship to the vegetable matrix of the planet is what constitutes uh, a uh, Gaian resurgence, that it is plants that regulate the composition of the atmosphere, the temperatures of the oceans, so forth and so on, and that it is our lack of integration into that system that has precipitated the crisis of toxic 20th century uh, potlatch civilization. Uh, by potlatch, a potlatch was a custom of the Northwest Coast Indians where they would uh, uh, to show their wealth, destroy huge amounts of material so that houses would be burned, feathered blankets burned, totem poles burned in the potlatch in an orgy of destruction which proves your wealth. And we have assimilated and perfected this custom so that it is second nature to us. And the whole planet is a vast potlatch we are robbing our children and their children of any sort of recognizable future by basically grabbing it all for ourselves. No other society in history has been so callous to human values that it condemned generations unborn of its own uh, children to live in a, in a uh, desert. Nevertheless, this is our style we're trying to do something about this at Botanical Dimensions by preserving these plants with a shamanic history. Uh, if you're interested, contact uh, Botanical Dimensions about that. Well, what I thought I would do this evening is um, offer not a summation of content, which I gave yesterday at the section of what this month has been, but instead of a summation of content, a kind of summation of intention. What was intended to come across and what now, having lectured 45 hours, stands out in my mind as uh, essential to uh, what I'm trying to put across. The main thing, I think, that comes out of an effort to formulate a psychedelic point of view, and I take it this is what we have been involved in. A psychedelic point of view means a point of view which honors consciousness. Consciousness is seen 
as the value to be maximized. That's what we want. We want more consciousness, better integration, better information, better models. Uh, we don't want to petrify ourselves or commit ourselves mm -hmm. to a model that somehow then is found to be ab obsolete and inadequate. So what chiefly constitutes the psychedelic point of view, I think, is its open-ended and provisional nature, as opposed to every other ideology or point of view that's running around. We have to, what, what the psychedelic point of view is, is a kind of cultural relativism. We're trying to get a grip on who and where we are in the cosmos from a point of view not that of the American consumerist citizen, something else, something larger, deeper, broader, more touched by the cosmic, more touched by a sense of the past and uh, of destiny. So I have said this many times, but I want to say it now in a slightly different context and discuss it. The statement of the British um, enzymologist J.B.S. Haldane, who discovered uh, enzymes, so he became an enzymologist, a logical move. Haldane said, um, the world is not only stranger than we suppose, it is stranger than we can suppose. And this is something that we have not entertained very seriously as a possibility, especially the cheerful characters in the white coats with the clipboards. The assumption has always been that man's mind, notice the gender slant, man's mind is uh, sufficient for the cognition of the cosmos. This is not all that surprising, though it is patently idiotic. It is not all that surprising uh, when you think about the fact that as recently as, let's say, 1830, people believed the Earth was 4,000 years old. As recently as uh, 1480, the New World was unsuspected to exist, or it was suspected by a few wild-eyed map makers and mad sailors. But conventional knowledge held that, you know, the Eurasian landmass in connection with Africa, that that was it. So when we look back into our recent past, we discover tremendous epistemic naivete. That means people didn't know what was going on. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't even close. And, and yet we are asked to believe that somewhere after Darwin and before now, it was all figured out. And now we view the universe from a lofty pinnacle of integrated understanding. Now the physics explains biology, biology explains culture, culture explains sociology, so forth and so on. Well. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this is really whistling past the graveyard because, meanwhile, the visible consequences of this understanding are spreading chaos, a dissolution of values, an inability to control technology, an inability to set reasonable political goals such as moderation of population growth and carry them out. Instead, somehow, this uh, deep insight into how everything works has left everything a mess. And, you know, what does that mean about us? Why is that and what can be done about it? Well, I think the problem is that we have too long ignored the possibility that reality is stranger than we can suppose. I mean, let this reverberate in your mind, not that, that means no model will ever work. It means it will always be provisional, that the understanding of what it is will always recede ahead of any epistemic program
to describe, enclose, explain. This is all uh, a fallacy if you believe that you are embarked on a finite project where eventually you will issue a white paper and that will explain how the boar ate the cabbage. It's not to be explained. And we have, uh, I think because of unique uh, characteristics of the male ego, chosen to operate with the assumption that we can understand, that the human mind can in fact grok larger and larger levels of embeddedness and make sense of them. Uh, what the psychedelic experience, number one, and point of view, number two, is saying is that we have the means present at hand to completely explode this nonsensical fiction of certitude. And yet we choose not to confront it. This is why I first proposed calling this facing the answer. Because the answer about how you understand the universe is the same answer that you get when you ask the question, how am I to understand my own life? It can't be understood. It is a receding mystery. It is a continuing carrot. It cannot be brought under the aegis of rational apprehension. It says in Moby Dick, reality outran apprehension. It always outruns apprehension because apprehension is the primitive functioning of the primate neural network. And reality who knows? Who would even care to take a guess, you know? It's a, it's a mystery. You do not measure the depth of a universal mystery with the neural network of a primate. Our role is not to understand, but to appreciate. To appreciate. We have an immense capacity for resonance with beauty, aesthetic awareness, appreciation of form, appreciation of how things go together. Notice this word appreciation, appreciation. We need, if you don't know what's going on in a dinner, at a dinner party, in a corporation, in an environment, then the best course is to keep your mouth shut and pay attention and try to appreciate the situation. It's ridiculous to attempt to seize the tiller of reality because we don't even know where we want to go. So the notion that by creating these models of reality which are not acknowledged as models but which are called scientific truth, we betray ourselves down the primrose path that leads to dreary, dusty death because what we do is we take the poetry out of being. We extract the poetry from being by the assumption of the mundane. The banality of modernity is what I call this. The banality of modernity, the steady flattening of values so that nothing means much. You know, the sense of outrage over political mistreatment of the underprivileged or the sense of outrage as a society slips toward the abyss, or the sense of outrage when people mistreat you, uh, is muted. Everything is flattened by the banality of modernity. This is the heritage of all the bad little boys of the 19th century, Nietzsche and Darwin and Hegel and Schopenhauer. These clowns were on a bad trip and they were loud about it. <laughs> and what they give us is a universe devoid of soul. Man looms larger and larger. Notice the gender slant. Man looms larger and larger in the picture. And what this ushers into is uh, fascism, pure and simple. And it's not surprising because this calling forth of the image of man into larger and larger perspective has been the program of monotheism for 3,000 years. 
It has been a relentless accentuation of the centrality of the human image, the male dominant human image. And in the, in the uh, transmutation of Hellenistic Judaism that becomes Christianity, the final apotheosis of this uh, uh, point of view is created in the notion that man can be God. That's it. And it is hailed as a tremendous infusion of existential validity into the human image, the greatest stride ever, the greatest single stride ever taken in the definition of human ontology. Well, I would like to suggest to you it was the greatest backward step ever taken because what it did was it shoved nature further and further into the background. Nature is something from which we torment her secrets. This is Francis Bacon. We, we torture nature to obtain her secrets. The world is created for man. It is for man to remake in his image all this gender stuff. And it is uh, then no wonder that building on that foundation, 19th century rationalism, which thought it was putting these things behind it, it, it conceived itself as anti-clerical, as anti-monotheism uh, 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 and Christianity in some sense. And yet what it really did was it just stripped away the Baroque trappings. Hans Jonas was very acute in pointing out that third century Hellenistic Gnosticism and Heideggerian philosophy are essentially the same thing. It's just that in the, in the Gnostic recension, you know, you get all these uh, sexy, you get demons and angels and levels and the emanation from the pleroma and the clash of the archons, opera, opera. In the Heideggerian recension, they've just gotten down to the nitty gritty, but the message is the same. Man is thrown into the unknown. Man is in the abyss, lost. All meaning must come from within. All order must come from an inner vision. We are abandoned. This is Heideggerian language. We are abandoned. Well, this is permission then for pathology because it is a point of view purchased at the cost of ignoring the facts of the matter. And that is, in my definition, a delusion. A point of view purchased at the expense of the facts of the matter. You know, Whitehead said there are stubborn facts. You can reduce and reduce all you want, but there are certain stubborn facts. Well, one of them is the primacy of nature, a stubborn fact which was ignored by this tradition. Once nature is taken as the ground of being, then the permission to inflate the image of the ego is denied. And I think that this is happening globally, very slowly, under pressure, under duress, because our backs are to the wall. We are seeing a planetary crisis unfold before our eyes and you know blame has not yet come into the rhetoric but eventually it's going to be understood who's to blame and it isn't the tribesmen of New Guinea or the Indians of Siberia it is Western male scientific technological hubris that has claim center stage like a noisy drunk and then just proceeded to hold us all prisoner while it acted out a, uh, a process that is rooted in its own traumatic birth, in the sundering of the symbiotic relationship to the vegetable matrix that characterized uh, prehistory. Well, so what I'm offering as a counterpoise to that is this notion of provisional models. Nature is not mute. 
This is what Sartre said, nature is mute. He was another one of these people who pushed this existential line in one form or another. Nature is not mute. Nature is full of affection and intentionality toward humankind. But intuition must be given prominence in the, in the rearrangement of our relationship with the world. And I, want to, I talked uh, the other night about uh, induction and intuition, and I want to say just a little bit more about it tonight. Different things. Science runs on induction, which is a very low-grade form of logic. It means you do something over and over again, and if it happens the same way a hundred times, you have confidence that the hundred and first time it will happen the same way. Intuition doesn't work like that. Intuition, as I said the other night, leaves no trail. And most of us are accustomed to thinking of intuition as something feminine, mysterious, unexplainable, and uh, sort of magical. And also, I think, because we live in a male-dominant society, we undervalue it. If someone, has in, if someone claims intuition, our position is probably one of prove it, doubt in the face of the assertion, you see. But there's an interesting thing about intuition that I don't think many people understand or have bothered to look at, which is, did you know, I'll bet you did know, uh, mathematics is based on intuition. There's a, now, half of mathematics would rise with a screech of horror at this <laughs> statement. But the other half of mathematics calls itself intuitional mathematics. Okay, well now, what's going on here? Probably if you are not a professional philosopher of science, you are accustomed to associating mathematics with science rather closely. This is because science, in order to give itself legitimacy, has very slyly appropriated mathematics, especially in the 20th century, to its purposes. But if we talk about what is called pure mathematics, which is the great love of mathematicians, the other kind of mathematics is applied mathematics, and that's for engineers and technologists and is not you know, what moves them to the edge of their chair. But if we think about uh, pure mathematics, it is an activity carried on in the mind based on uh, deductive truth. Deductive, not inductive. In other words, a statement is made. It can be anything. All grays are non-X. This is just a statement. We don't yet know what this is going to be about. All grays are non-X. All greens are F sub 1. What we're putting in place are a set of statements that appear nonsensical, but what we will assert is that we should seek a relationship between them and that that will then show us something. And this is how mathematics really works. It has very little to do with number. It has to do with the conceptualizing of relationships, conceptualizing them, and then exploring your intuition about these conceptions. And then the third and very late stage is you write a formal statement of your cognitive activity around these assumptions. So you see, mathematics is entirely intuitional. It leaves no track. It is drawn from this other domain. Well, uh, why has it been appropriated by science? Well, for a very funny and not well understood reason. Mathematics has been appropriated by science because mathematics has an uncanny ability to describe nature. Completely uncanny. Now, you may, you may have never asked yourself, why is mathematics such a powerful tool for the description of nature? 
Maybe you thought that somebody else can answer this and that it's not a problem. Well, I've got news for you. It is a problem. Nobody has any good ideas about why mathematics describes nature, but notice that mathematics is an intuitional activity. An intuitional activity describes nature without the intercession of inductive science. Inductive science is a kind of naive holdover from Greek uh, uh, Democritian theories, where everything is conceived of as clearly conceivable and operating according to known laws. But in fact, the deeper structure of nature is not modeled out of an examination of data obtained by measurement. That isn't how it works these days. The deeper description of nature is achieved by taking weird objects from the frontiers of mathematics, these things dreamed up in the confines and depths of the human mind and inside computers, and then laying them over nature and seeing, my gosh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between, let us say, uh, the uh, multidimensional catastrophes described by René Tom and uh, the dripping of a faucet, the uh, turbulence in a brook, the voting patterns in a ghetto. All of these things are seen to be easily modeled by, by extremely exotic mathematical objects discovered through intuition within the mind. Well, what does this mean? Well, it means, if it means anything, I mean, before we draw the deeper conclusion, what is the conclusion on the surface? It must be that the unaided human mind is more capable of correctly modeling nature than the human mind that works through the methodological inductive approach called science. And in fact, this is clearly true because the world described by science, a scientific description of this room, would say very little about all the important things going on in it. A scientific description of this room would leave out personality, would leave out linguistic intent, would leave out the uniqueness of each of us. For science, we are merely members of the human species. Again, this flattening, this reductionism, this betrayal of the quintessence of the phenomenon in a desperate effort to achieve closure in the modeling process. And so then you do achieve closure, but the model is always inadequate. It's always inadequate. So then there's this sense of frustration. We can't, we can't get closure with the model unless we tell a lie, unless we deny the complexity, the interrelatedness, the soulness, the spiritness, the mindfulness. All of these things are, for science, what are called uh, secondary properties. They are epiphenomenal. They are only uh, an aspect of your point of view, like an iridescence on a butterfly's wing or something like that. In fact, that is the classic reductionist definition of consciousness. It is an iridescence that appears on the surface of neural processing that we mistake for true being. <laughs> and yet somehow we are embedded within this iridescence and it is from within this iridescence that we launch the descriptive models that then deny our existential validity. Well, so this has been a, 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 an onanistic exercise, uh, is one way of putting it, and there must be others. Okay, so then what is the path of intuition in relationship to nature that is different from the path of uh, science? In a way, it's only a shift of emphasis. 
William Blake said, attend the minute particulars. Attend the minute particulars. This is very good, uh, very good advice for science, and it is very good advice for mathematics. And what I'm suggesting here tonight is that we have misconstrued mathematics and have bought the notion that it is a part of science, when actually it stands ready to empower intuition and to sweep science, if not away, at least into a more proper role, more befitting its extremely limited application to the higher orders of reality that we really care about. I mean, science is really, uh, it, it's the plumbing level of reality. It doesn't catch, you know, the integrated nature of language, the evolution of fairy tale, the dynamics of love affairs, uh, the quintessence of genius. These are the things that as human beings structure and constellate and guide and inform our world. And science has nothing to say about these things. Mathematics, on the other hand, is like the bedrock celebration of these things. It empowers intuition. It discovers intuition to be the most powerful epistemic tool that we have. More powerful than induction, more powerful than deduction. Intuition is the unifying of experience into a gestalt image of the world, a coming together within the organism of a correct imaging of the world. Now, what do I mean by correct imaging? All I mean is a provisional image that carries you to the next moment. This is all we can hope for at this stage. We are much more suited for dancing than for whatever it is that we have been doing. You know, whatever it was, it wasn't dancing. We are a part of nature, we are a part of light, we are a part of the energy field of the planet. We are not its keeper in the sense that it is not given unto us to understand it. That was all a horrible misunderstanding. The idea that we should understand reality and then somehow make something of it. <coughs> Alfred North Whitehead said uh, that understanding is the apperception of pattern as such. As such. That's all. So here we have a room full of people. Well, I, it's a pattern. It's many patterns. It's the pattern of how men and women are mixed together statistically as we scan from left to right. If I see a pattern there, I know something about the crowd. I understand something about the crowd. The pattern tells me something and I call that understanding. But we could analyze the crowd from the point of view of the distribution of young people and old people, or people in uh, colors in the red-blue spectrum as according to the yellow-white spectrum. Each one of these things is a way of analyzing the pattern in the room. And each one of these patterns tells the perceiver more about what is going on in the room. Because the room is not a distribution of young people and old people, a distribution of men and women, or a distribution of garment colors. The room is a mystery a recessional mystery that presents itself as a series of interlocking patterns of infinite depth. And so in building collective epistemologies, this is what we must ask of these epistemologies, that they give us the experience of understanding. And the experience of understanding is largely intuitional. How much of an experience of understanding do you have when you examine what modern physics is saying about the origin of the universe? I submit not much, because it is so clearly uh, the product of abstraction, the product of the phonetic alphabet, the male ego. They've set all the interesting stuff back in the first three minutes. Who can go and look? It's all stacked against 
empowering the perceiver. It's all stacked against empowering the perceiver. You can't even check the statements these people are making unless you happen to have a uh, $125 million colliding Bevatron or something, and the understanding to use it and interpret the results. So what we have is a priesthood off on the edge of things, propounding great profundities that nowhere touch the heart, nowhere empower the individual, nowhere strengthen the dyad, or reinforce the family, or give support to the downtrodden. It doesn't seem to be about that. In other words, the explanation of the world is not a human explanation. A human explanation must come from intuition. It must come from poetry. It must come, ultimately, from experience. And by experience, I don't mean uh, the experimental method of science, which is that things are pulled apart, taken down to their lowest common denominator, and then described. I mean, if you do, that's like, that's like believing that you understand Los Angeles if you have the telephone directory, <laughs> you know? I mean, this is the level of genetics today. What they, say, they say they understand life, and they have the telephone directory, and they're talking about Los Angeles, because they can look up, you know, where the genes are, the coding for the proteins, you know? Does this tell us anything about a broken heart, or a messiah, or a Hitler? I don't think so. So what we are trying to do is return the focus of attention to individual experience. We have been slave too long to ideology transmitted hierarchically and based on a tremendously alienating instrumentality. That's what science depends on now, a tremendously alienating instrumentality. What we need to do is empower experience. Well, this is where the psychedelics come in, because citizens don't take psychedelics because it's illegal. Neither do marionettes, neither do robots. None of these well-behaved and mechanistic reductionist images of humanity take psychedelics because it's misbehaving. Misbehaving is a great sin. In fact, it's enshrined as the first sin. You'll regard that the psychedelic issue was there in Eden, and somebody misbehaved, and then they got tossed out forever and their children's children into the chaos of history. It's interesting to read in Genesis why this was. It was because they will become as we are says Yahweh. They will become as we are if they eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. I suggest to you that this is precisely what we should seek to do, and that this we is the voice of hierarchy, the voice of paternalism, the voice of the male ego finally right up into the storm god, the volcano god who lies uh, back there in the origins of monotheism. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. It's a wonderful thing to learn to be able to stand up and yell bullshit. It, I, I did it when I first when I was about 18 years old, and it was the meme of the hour, and uh, it, held, it, it blew their minds. It did blow their minds. It was uncivil. <laughs> it was uncivil. It lacked polity. It was rude and crude and correct. Correct. Because so much is being slung, and nobody is talking about the primacy of experience and the dignity of the individual. The dignity of the individual. We went a long way with this in America before we betrayed it. And it wasn't only betrayed by the clowns in Washington. 
It's also betrayed by anybody who clusters themselves around the feet of some self-proclaimed nabob. Because the fact of the matter is, nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows. Nobody has the faintest idea. The best guesses are lies. You may be sure of it. And so to pretend that one human being will lead another out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth is ludicrous, absolutely grotesque, a product of this empowering of the human image that has gone on through several thousand years of dominator culture. If you want a teacher, try a waterfall or a mushroom or a mountain wilderness or a storm-pounded seashore. This is where the action is. It's not back in the hive. It's not in the anthill. It's not knocking your head against the floor in front of somebody who claims that because of their lineage and whose feet they washed and whose feet they washed that you should give credence to them. Knowledge is provisional. And uh, we, we are yet to approach even the first moment of civilized understanding. The way it is to be done is by trusting yourself, trusting your intuition. Reject authority. Authority is a lie and an abomination. Authority will lead you into ruin. It's not real. And it isn't, don't get the idea that it's this liberal rap about how everybody has a piece of the action. You know, the Jews know something, the Buddhists know something, the Huichol know something. Nonsense, rubbish, nobody knows anything. These are different kinds of shell games that have been worked out by priestly castes of people to keep things under control. Institutions seek to maximize control, control, control. That's what they're into. Did you think they were in the business of enlightening you, saving your soul? Forget it. Control is what this is all about. And to the degree that we commit ourselves to ideology, we are poisoned. Any ideology, Marxism, Catholicism, objectivism, you name it, rubbish, all rubbish. What is real is experience. What is real is this moment. And so then what it becomes about is what are the frontiers of experience? How much of that has been taken away from us by these dominators, by these priesthoods, by these cults, by these philosophical shell games? Well, a lot. That's the whole story of history. Our growing unease, our growing disease, our malaise is all about the fact that we are kept from the wellspring of experience. We are sexually repressed. You may not feel it, but look back a hundred years to a world where pianos wore pants. You know, we, maybe we've made a little progress on the sexual thing. Maybe not. Maybe more or less than we think. But we are repressed in all of these areas. Uh, and we are particularly repressed in the area that relates to the psychedelic experience. Because it is... Uh, it is raid to the dominator insect invasion. They can't take it. They can't stand it because it empowers the individual. It dissolves the cheerful model of science. It's just exposed as, you know, a nice story. It enriches the accessible universe tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. It makes the individual complete within his or her self. And this completion of the individual is extremely destructive to the plan of the dominators, which is that you will be a cog in a machine. You will participate in the life of an organization, not your life, the life of an organization. You will go to some bullshit job. You will pour the best years of your life and your genius and your hopes into this. You will serve an institution. You will serve, 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 serve. Well, 
it's a bad idea for free people to go along with this. A much better idea would be to insist on the dignity of human beings, to recognize that the freeing of slaves, the giving of the vote to women, the ending of public whippings, that this program of political enlightenment must also then include hands off on how people want to relate to changing their minds. We are not interested in being sexually regulated by the state, and we are not interested in being intellectually, spiritually, emotionally manipulated by the state. The state should stand down in this issue. The state is acting as the enforcing arm of the dominator culture, specifically of fundamentalist screwballs who, you know, are horrified by all this, by the notion that people would claim the authenticity of their own minds, that people would stand in the light of nature and reject original sin and the guilt from Eden and, you know, the sins of the fathers and all this rubbish which is handed down. What the archaic revival is going to have to mean if it has teeth is a re-empowering of the individual and a consequent lowering of the, of the profile of institutions, especially government. We need to think about these things because we have bought into the idea that we have to serve and behave and be enslaved, else chaos will engulf the world. We need to carry out our analysis of the situation to the point where we can embrace chaos and see that chaos is the environment in which we all thrive. That's how I've done it for years. You think I could have lived, you think I could have gotten away with this in the Soviet Union? I don't think so. I require a society on the brink of social breakdown to be able to do <laughs> my work. And, uh, and I think a society on the brink of social breakdown is the healthiest situation for individuals. I don't know how many of you have ever had the privilege of being in a society in a pre-revolutionary situation, but the cafes stay open all night and there's music in the streets, and you can breathe it, you can feel it, and you know what is happening. The dominator is being pushed. It never succeeds. It never, uh, it never is able to claim itself. But on the other hand, history is young. We may have, uh, we may have a crack at this, a global society is coming into being. A global society made out of information that was not intended to be ours, but which is ours through the mistaken invention and distribution of small computers, the printing press, all of this stuff. Information is power, and information has been spilled by the clumsy handling of the cybernetic revolution by the dominator culture in, so that it is everywhere. Never has the situation been more fluid. Never have uh, the opportunities for infiltration, insurrection, and hell-raising been more present at hand. But we have to seize the opportunity. We have to seize the opportunity because the world doesn't have that much more to run unless somebody begins to shake the apple cart. If we don't begin to shake the apple cart, then the apple cart is just going to sail over the cliff and be lost. So the psychedelics are very hot in this because they dissolve boundaries. They dissolve assumptions. And our task, our being the uh, everyone who seeks self-empowerment through experience, our task is to dissolve the assumptions of the dominator culture and make it impossible for it to work. This, I think, is already happening. We have nature on our side, you see. Nature is beginning to kick up. 
And you know, it may alarm you that they're cutting down the Amazon rainforest, but imagine if you were the clown who owns it, how alarmed he is. He sees it as an investment. He thinks he owns it. And when he sees that it's being destroyed, he's extremely alarmed. The fact that nature is itself being seen as a limited resource is a tremendous tilt to our side because the, the provisional model, psychedelic, open-ended partnership way of doing things is uh, the only style that can perhaps seize the controls of this sinking submarine and get it back to the surface so that we can figure out what should be done. If we continue as we have, then you know we're doomed. And the judgment of some higher power on that will be, they didn't even struggle. You know, they went to the boxcars with their suitcases and they didn't even struggle. This is too nightmarish to contemplate. We're talking about the fate of a whole planet. Why are people so polite? Why are they so patient? Why are they so forgiving of gangsterism and betrayal? Uh, it's very difficult to understand. I believe it's because the dominator culture is increasingly more and more sophisticated in its perfection of subliminal mechanisms of control. And I don't mean anything grandiose and paranoid. I just mean that through press releases and sound bites and the enforced idiocy of television, uh, the 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 drama of a dying world has been turned into a soap opera for most people. And they don't understand that it's, it's their story and that they will eat it in the final act if somewhere between here and the final act they don't stand up on their hind legs and howl. So this whole uh, effort to bring the psychedelic experience back into prominence is an effort to empower individuals and to get them to see that we are bled of our authenticity by vampirish institutions that will never of their own accord leave us alone. There must be a moment when the machinery and the working of the machinery becomes so odious that people are willing to stride forward and throw sand on the track and uh, force a reevaluation of the situation. And it's not done through organizing, it's not done through vanguard parties or cadres of intellectual elites, it's done through just walking away from all of that, claiming your identity, claiming your vision, your being, your intuition, and then acting from that without regret, cleanly, without regret. Thank you very much. I'll take questions. Does anybody have a question? <laughs> I have a statement, Robert. Oh, good. I thought it was going to be something else. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, the reason I, I don't take psychedelics with the same frequency as I used to when I was younger is not because I, I view it as misbehavior, but because I've, I've read enough research articles that scare me and because I've, I've, I've counseled enough individuals who have taken a lot of psychedelics and, and their behavior. Uh, gives me pause for concern, and, and, and I'm a little concerned that you seem to be uh, overlooking some of these. Uh, yes. Well, facts. I have you ever heard me before? Because I've never seen you before. Is that true? You yeah. heard? Yeah. Well, see, this is the culmination of a fairly intensive presentation that dealt with every drug in detail, doses, toxicity the problems of set and setting, uh, the problem of synthetic versus natural, 
the problem of hedonic patterns of use, addiction, social factors, all of this stuff. So if you just walked in and here's this character advocating this thing and it sounds pretty wild-eyed, uh, there are lots of constraints on my recommendation that I hope most of the people in the audience are aware of. I'm not advocating unrestricted use of drugs. In fact, I'm fairly Calvinistic about drugs. I like plants. I think drugs should mimic neurotransmitters. I think the closer they are to ordinary brain chemistry uh, the, and the least, less in, invasive they are, and this is very important. Granted, there are psychedelic drug casualties, but without uh, and you mentioned papers that you've read. This was your weakest argument because human research has been so stifled by government control over the past 25 years that uh, there is none. So what you're talking about is either rat data, which has its place, but is by no means the last word, or you're talking about 25-year-old research that has never been looked at. I believe, and part of the reason I'm here, and part of the reason I try to speak to these kinds of audiences, is that psychedelics at this stage in the process must be welded to the notion of psychotherapy. Uh, not strongly, but that we need sitters, we need empathetic people, we need people who have seen people go through a lot, and those people can help people to come to terms with the psychedelic experience. Uh, it is, to me, a travesty that we are so infantile and have been for centuries that we accept lives where we go from the cradle to the grave without the psychedelic experience. This is like choosing not to have sex. It's that important. It's that central to who you are. And, you know, there are celibate people, but I don't, uh, I don't see them as uh, experts on how to live. And I certainly don't think that people who are completely unaware of the psychedelic experience have very much to say to the rest of us, even if they hang out shingles that say that they're psychoanalysts or psychotherapists or something like that. I mean, it's the mind. It's a huge portion of the mind. If you are treating mad people, severely disturbed people, you as a resident should have been exposed to situations of severe disturbance and, uh, and uh, quasi-madness and abreaction and recovery of traumatic material. Otherwise, you're just polishing the Cadillac in darkness. You work from theory. Oh God, working on the mind from theory when here are uh, traditions of psychedelic plant use thousands of years old that have evolved into extremely sophisticated uh, mental health care delivery systems. Uh, it's just to tie the physician's hands and to tie the individual's hands. I don't say that it's not dangerous. And the more ignorant you are, the more dangerous it is. This is certainly true. The, if you're thinking about taking psychedelics, the first stop should be the library. Read what is said and read it with a critical eye. And then talk to people. That's the next thing. The library is not itself sufficient because uh, funny notions get carried along in the literature. And many a, a researcher has given LSD or psilocybin to many, many graduate students and never really taken it themselves. I mean, I know these people. And they're very hands-off. And they're very, they fear madness. They are self-diagnosed as mad. And so they will not take psychedelics. And they are mad. They're right. They know it. Anybody who runs around in a white coat with a clipboard pontificating to the rest of us based on ratomorphic data is a mad person. And, they, and so they're terrified of it. 
But if you're if you haven't worked yourself into that kind of a position, uh, you don't have to have this same set of uh, reflexes. It's very very threatening to the male ego. And when you get into the, you know, the the professional scientist, the professional uh, jurist, uh, judiciary, government. This is all about holding it in and role playing and always being right and always appearing correct in the eyes of your colleague. This is no place where somebody is going to experiment with something which is going to have them howling at the moon, even if that's what they need. So I appreciate your concern. I'm the guy who says these terrible things, and you just happen to wander in here. I'm the only guy around who does this. And uh, I apologize for your discomfiture, but maybe that reassures you. There aren't dozens or hundreds of people <laughs> like this. Anybody else? Sure. Yes, well, I, I think I made it clear. I'm all for appropriating mathematics. That's all we need. The mathematics is how they did their magic. Even though science is tremendously epistemically naive, the weird thing about science, you see, is that it's very old. Science is old. I mean, it was practiced in the 5th century BC. And like any old enterprise, its most basic assumptions are its least examined assumptions. And so science makes a whole bunch of assumptions that it always has made. One of them I attack tonight, the knowability of the universe. Science assumes that the universe can be known. I see no reason to be persuaded of this. The other is that time is an invariable that you see science rests on experiment. And the idea is that whenever you perform an experiment, that doesn't matter. So the, the notion of the, the uh, non-variance of time, and yet in our love affairs, in our marriages and careers and the corporations we move through and so forth, we see that timing is always of the essence. No love affair is like any other love affair. No corporate takeover is like any other corporate takeover. These are highly complex phenomena that uh, the assumption of temporal invariance there is com completely inappropriate. I agree that there is elegance and thrill in, in the explanation of process. I came up through science. I mean, I'm very sympathetic to it. it is, an epistemolo it is an epistemology of great power, but it is not a meta-epistemology. It is not so powerful that other epistemological systems should seek to be judged by it. And this is what science always wants to do. It wants to say, astrology, that's nonsense. Well. Uh, Find a, philo find a uh, scientist who can cast a horoscope. You know, these people who signed this statement a few years ago that astrology was a pseudoscience, not one could cast a horoscope. Not one had the faintest notion what was actually going on. They simply saw that it was not scientific. And for them, if it's not scientific, it's no good. But science itself has been effective only in very provisionally defined areas. I mean, it's great on the energies of the atom. It's very good uh, with astrophysics, 
but the but you know the data who who has access to it in the primary form except people with enormous instruments but science has not delivered an understanding of man or society or planetary dynamics or the mind or free will all of this has been completely outside of its can so it is an epistemic tool of great power so is Taoism so is magic so is intuition uh, astrology has its place um, there is no meta epistemology there is you see this is something people don't understand all you can ask of a theory an idea a model all that you can ask of a model is that it be internally consistent that means that within its own terms it doesn't contradict itself if it contradicts itself within its own terms it's just ridiculous and we don't have to worry about that astrology does not contradict itself within its own terms it's a set of interlocking concepts modalities calculations mathematical formulae and it all works atomic physics a similar structure but you don't ask does atomic physics contradict astrology they're not the same system they do not say anything about each other they are completely different things and they are as uh, intellectual objects they have the same dimensionality and they exist on the same plane one is not superior to the other so internal self-consistency is all that is required of an idea or a personality or a uh, any organism that's what an organism is it's an internally self-consistent operating system of some sort and uh, science was so successful in areas which impacted very strongly on daily life that it was allowed to make this claim to epistemic preeminence without ever being slapped down and told you know that's none of your business that's not part of what you're about and whenever you see scientists pontificating on non-scientific subjects you should realize that these are utterly ordinary people they don't have any special insight uh, at all they are practitioners of a certain point of view but that doesn't empower them to pass judgment on all other points of view that's where they have gotten into a, uh, a hubristic uh, uh, delusion so science where appropriate and only where appropriate anybody else no okay well I want to thank you all again not only for this evening but for the month and uh, Esalen is a wonderful second home to me and my wife and my children I'm very concerned about free speech freedom of thought these things are uh, endangered memes. Esalen has always tolerated and even encouraged me, and I think this is extremely laudable and brave. They don't have to do that. Uh, somebody else could sit here and amuse you, and it wouldn't cause any ripples. So I'm very appreciative to Esalen for its commitment to free speech. I'm appreciative to you. This may have outraged some of you, you were very uh, noble about it. Uh, civilized dialogue is our last best hope, and we must preserve theaters and opportunities for civilized dialogue. The best idea will win. The best idea will win. Thank you very much. <laughs>